welcome back to the Jacob Kersey program. I'm Jacob Kersey, at Real Jacob Kersey on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you want to connect with me, realjacobkersey at gmail.com. There you can send any questions, comments, or concerns you might have. would love to hear from you. I'm excited to be back, and uh, it's election year, which is great. We've already uh, done some episodes this month. We haven't really talked much about the election on the podcast so far, and uh, now that we're getting started with the primaries and everything, I think it's a perfect time uh, to get started talking about everything that's been going on this roller coaster of uh, primaries so far. Very interesting. I love watching it all unfold. It is it is quite the entertainment. Uh, and so joining me today to talk about this and to give her commentary over what's been happening is Madeline Fry. And Madeline Fry is a commentary writer for the Washington Examiner. Uh, she has also contributed to the Federalist, the Heartland Institute, National Review Online, and Philanthropy Magazine. She studied French and journalism at Hillsdale College, and I'm very excited to have her on the program. She was on at uh, CPAC 2019, if any of you remember the name. Uh, but if not, or you're just new to the program, uh, Madeline Fry coming on for the second time. Madeline, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So... There's been a lot going on over the past few days, uh, uh, the past couple of weeks with this, the primaries coming in. And it almost seems like the only thing that's going on is the Democratic primaries because uh, there's really not much happening on the Republican side except uh, President Trump just sweeping everything. Right. Uh, but on the Democratic side, there is a lot of drama going on. Uh, so what is your first take just looking at all that's going on in the Democratic primary? Yeah, so the drama started last week. We had the first um, the first caucuses in Iowa, which uh, if you paid attention at all, all that you really need to know is that it was a dumpster fire. They could not um, finish counting the votes by the end of the night or even the next day, and uh, it really is not going to look good for the people who did well in Iowa. Um, and then we had New Hampshire this week. Um, which was led by Bernie Sanders, followed by Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, which is very interesting considering Sanders is um, a democratic socialist. Pete Buttigieg and Klobuchar position themselves more as moderate, um, which could indicate that the Democrats are kind of split between their moderate candidates and the more far left ones. But I think the most interesting thing about New Hampshire is how terribly Warren and Biden did. Biden has potentially the most experience of anyone, and Warren has um, had the backing of the media for years. So the people who are succeeding are not the people necessarily necessarily that the Democratic establishment want to succeed. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, it seems like if they want to beat Trump so bad, and that's what we've heard the past four years from everyone in the Democratic Party, then it seems like you would have a at least, at least one solid candidate that people can get behind and support if they really want to beat Trump. But all I'm seeing is just everyone split six, seven, eight different ways. And mm -hmm. you mentioned the, the people we thought were going to be leaders, Sanders, Warren, and Biden, are really underperforming. And even though Sanders uh, is is leading uh, in, in a majority of polls, and they expect, you know, if, if – there's a lot of Democrats that stay in the race. Sanders could be the nominee uh, for the Democratic mm -hmm. uh, side. Uh, I know in Iowa he got 26.1% or of the vote, came in second mm -hmm. place there right behind Pete Buttigieg. But in 2016 he got 49.6% of the vote. And in New Hampshire, same thing. Uh, he got 25.7% of the vote and – in 2016, he got 60.4 percent of the vote. So really, Sanders, Warren, and Biden are all underperforming, and Warren and Biden haven't dropped out. I remember right after the Iowa caucuses, I tweeted this out: "What if Sanders, Warren, and Biden were all beaten by another candidate?" And that is why uh -huh. the results have been delayed. And I was right about two: Warren and Biden really uh -huh. underperformed there, and it's it's uh, quite interesting to see. Yeah, the interesting thing about Sanders is uh, he, I think, personally is, is very popular. Somehow people are attracted to the sort of grumpy old man vibe that he has. Um, but still, voters are not really interested in electing someone who's a socialist. So there was a Gallup poll conducted recently 
And more than nine in 10 Americans say they would vote for a presidential candidate who was who happened to be either black or Catholic or Hispanic or Jewish or a woman. Any of those things are fine. More than eight in 10 would be fine with someone who is an evangelical Christian, gay or lesbian. Um, and still um, a majority of Americans would be fine with someone who is under 40 or over 70, which is good, I guess, for most of the Democratic field. Um, but. Uh, more than 50 percent said they would not vote for a socialist candidate. So that is going to hurt Bernie. I think now he has a lot of support. But if he were to face against Trump, a lot of people who may not necessarily support Trump are going to see someone who has identified with socialist policies on the other side, and they're not going to want to vote for him. Mm -hmm. now, I noticed something you mentioned there briefly was the, the diversity in the Gallup poll. But you look at the, the Democratic side right now. There's not much diversity, it doesn't seem. Uh, as far as I know, all the top Democratic candidates are white, and there's a lot of them that are old whites, not trying to be disrespectful. But you know, we've heard Democrats rant and rave about old white people ruling this country, messing this country mm -hmm. up. Look who their candidates are, <laughs> the yeah. leading candidates. I mean, except Pete Buttigieg, who is a young white. Um Right. But yeah, Bernie Sanders is 78. Joe Biden is 77. They're very old. Yeah. I, I heard something. Uh, I can't even remember who was talking about this a couple of days ago. Um, I believe it was Joe uh, Joe Biden talking about someone said that he, he doesn't even want to win. I think it might have been a caller on someone's uh, talk show. Anyway, a caller, I believe, called in, said something to the effect that you know Joe Biden just wants to win so uh, he can pass it on to his younger vice president because there's really no telling how long Sanders and um, Biden you know will last at mm -hmm. their age just yeah. because they are so old. Yeah, both of them are older than Trump. Elizabeth Warren is up there. She's 70. Mm -hmm. Trump is 73. It's just, just amazing. You know, in 2016, the Republican uh, primary group had more diversity than this Democratic primary group. You had Ben Carson, Marco Rubio, and Ted Cruz on mm -hmm. still still running at this time. Whereas, where's the diversity in the Democratic Party? I mean, I think the only yeah. diversity we might see is Pete Buttigieg, who is gay. Uh, speaking about that a little bit, I want to have your read on this. Pete Buttigieg, you know, I think. This this is just my opinion. I think that if he was not gay, he would be the Democratic front runner. I think the Democrats and, and the establishment and the reason they're not getting behind Pete Buttigieg is because even though they claim they are the party of diversity and how they support the LGBTQ movement, when they have an opportunity to put their money where their mouth is, they got a gay candidate. Who, quite honestly, if he just I, I, if he got more support, he would be their nominee. They're not getting behind them, and I can't help but wonder if it's because they know that if they get behind this gay candidate, he will not win the election because they know America is not ready for that. What do you think about? I that? think it, it may be more so that the DNC wants to protect establishment candidates, people particularly like Warren, who seems to be their preferred candidate, but um, Bernie is too out there with his progressive policies. Buttigieg, I think that I, I think that he could have a good chance um, in that poll. It's more than eight in 10 people said that they would support someone who is gay or lesbian. So I think that um, the tide is shifting on that. But I think that Pete Buttigieg's problem is not, um, it's not that it's more that the DNC sees him as a mayor from South Bend, Indiana, and he's not the type of person that they want to push um, with sort of their vocalizing their radical leftist agenda. You hear more of that from Elizabeth Warren or from Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. It's all interesting. Uh, and, and you know, I understand there's two different opinions on that. Also could be possibly two different opinions on this um, with a woman candidate. You know, they have mm -hmm. opportunities to run that narrative again, first woman president, because they could be running first gay president, but they're not. Um they also have the opportunity to be running first woman president again. But do you think that they're not running that narrative? Because if the president beats them again, which they possibly could, 
you know, running the first woman president narrative two times in a row. Could that be devastating for the Democratic Party and what they want to push, you know, in the future? Right. Well, the first woman president um, appeal is obviously not enough on its own. It didn't work in 2016. Um, and in the Democratic primary now, we have Elizabeth Warren and we have Amy Klobuchar, which uh, the New York Times endorsed both of them for president, I think, because they were trying to earn woke points by getting both of the female candidates. Their justification was that Elizabeth Warren is the progressive and um, Klobuchar is the moderate or realistic candidate. But um, Klobuchar actually did very well in New Hampshire. She beat out Elizabeth Warren. She got third place. And I think that she is a lot more appealing to um, more centrist Democratic voters because she speaks their language. She's from the Midwest. She talks about um, bringing people together when uh, during the last Democratic debate, the candidates were asked if they were worried about having a socialist or a Democratic socialist at the top of the ticket. Um, Klobuchar raised her hand. She's willing to admit that a lot of Democrats um, have their left-wing opinions, but they don't want to see socialism implemented in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was kind of surprised, and then the more I thought about it, not so much. Uh, but at first, I, w I was surprised that you know Klobuchar did as well as she did because you know we have or had all these candidates, and they were being talked about by the media: Biden, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, a little bit about Bernie Sanders, you know, all these people, and then Pete Buttigieg for a short time. Oh, they, they are the top runners. They are the forerunners, and then they all fall. And then Amy Klobuchar comes along. She never has that. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. she just performs really well in New Hampshire, and I can't help <laughs> but wonder if it's because, you know, every everyone else had really been taking shots from people had really been hurt by something, and Klobuchar was the only one that nobody had ever heard of, and so they just voted for her because everybody else had some something was wrong with everyone else, and so Klobuchar was just there, uh, you know, since everybody else had some mark or some flaw. Yeah, she's kind of a dark horse. There was not a lot of opposition uh, research or attacks made against her. There was a long piece, I think, in the New York Times a while back about um, problems with the way that she had treated her staffers, but at the time she was not a candidate that people were discussing much, so I don't think a lot of people have that in mind. And in their minds, they see her as someone who is a Democrat, someone who is a woman, and someone who is pretty moderate and seems likable and electable. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned um, her being kind of a centrist, and you mentioned earlier P Pete Buttigieg, people are thinking he's more moderate. You know, Something I saw uh, just a few minutes earlier – uh, was a poll in 2018 by Gallup. And they said 18% of Democrats believe that abortion should be legal in the third trimester. Only 18%. Mm -hmm. That was a 2018 Gallup poll, right? Well, Pete Buttigieg, who is, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, Pete Buttigieg is moderate. Well, Pete Buttigieg, apparently, um, according to, I believe, an interview he had on The View, he believes mm -hmm. that you know, there should be no restrictions on abortion right up to birth. And so yeah. the Democrats that are supposedly moderate, are they really moderate? And can they really appeal to those people in the middle? And can they really appeal to uh, the pro-life Democrats? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So the reason that I point out Klobuchar is that she recently was asked by someone at a campaign stop, is there space in the Democratic Party for people who are pro-life? That's a really big question because abortion is such a hot button issue, something that a lot of Democrats have campaigned on being radically pro-abortion. And Klobuchar um, is not moderate in her positions on abortion, but she did say that she is willing to work with people and accept people in the Democratic Party who are pro-life, which doesn't sound like much, but considering what other candidates have said, that's actually really huge because Buttigieg, as you mentioned, is kind of a fake moderate. He positions himself as, I'm not um, I'm not Bernie Sanders, I'm not doing Medicare for all, I'm going to do Medicare for all who want it, but he's actually pretty far left on a lot of things, including abortion. And you're right, he was on The View recently, and Meghan McCain was asking him um, what he thought about abortion, he had kind of alluded to um, saying that, oh, I, I read the Bible, and the Bible says that life begins at breath. So she was saying, are you saying that life doesn't begin until the baby is born? You can have an abortion up till any point during the pregnancy. 
And he kind of hedged a little bit and just said that I trust the woman. I trust her. Um, so Buddha judge really does support abortion at any point in the pregnancy, which is a radical stance that's opposed even by the majority of people who call themselves pro-abortion. So he's really not the moderate that he claims to be. Right. Yeah, it's uh, just a lot of chaos. And um, this 538 poll <clears throat> for uh, South Carolina still has Biden up. That's interesting. Sanders uh, coming in at second place. And then Klobuchar. Uh, coming in with only 2.9% chance behind Steyer, Warren, Bloomberg, and Buttigieg. So, you know, I, I wonder if the polls will be wrong and Klobuchar will continue to have success like in, in New Hampshire um, because, honestly, out of everyone, it seems like she's the only one who is somewhat moderate. Um, mm -hmm. Buttigieg, Biden, they're not. Um, yeah, I think I think Democrats would be really smart to go with Klobuchar. I think she has a pretty broad appeal in a way that a lot of the other candidates don't. Right. And, and then it just goes back to what I pointed out earlier is just do Democrats want to run that narrative again? Your first woman president, can they succeed against that? And if they lose two times in a row with that, I just – I don't know. I think, I think they're really um, scratching their heads trying to figure out what happened. Uh, I honestly thought they'd be a lot more unified than they are. Um, it's just amazing to see how, how, how much disunity is in the party. I know we're coming up to the end here, but you wrote an article uh, talking about Tom Steyer trying to buy his way uh, to victory. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Tom Steyer um, did pretty abysmally in New Hampshire. And in case for people who don't know who he is, um, he is a billionaire hedge fund manager whose claim to fame is um, founding the Need to Impeach campaign, and he's running a long shot 2020 presidential campaign, and he spent $19.2 million on TV and radio ads in New Hampshire, more than the next seven big spenders combined, uh, yet he only got 10,454 votes, according to the Washington Post, which means he spent more than $1,800 on each vote that he got. Um, so wow. in case anyone wants to tell you that money can buy elections, just go talk to Tom Steyer about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll definitely see how that works out. Uh, I know Bloomberg has been spending a lot more than Steyer. Um, Bloomberg mm -hmm. wasn't even in the New Hampshire, you know, as far as like he wasn't even running there in the New Hampshire uh, votes. But uh, Bloomberg for the two Super Tuesday states has outspent everyone. You know, Bloomberg, and this was posted by uh, CNN uh, just a little over 30 minutes ago. Bloomberg spent $129 million so far on the Super Tuesday states on advertising. Coming in yep. at second place, $25 million, Tom Steyer. Then $7 million in third place is Sanders. Warren spent 71000 Biden, Buttigieg, and Klobuchar have all spent zero. They're not even, they don't even have the money to spend on Super Tuesday states yet. And I can personally say that Bloomberg's advertisements have been flooding my television. I personally hate commercial mm -hmm. breaks now um, just because – even more than I did because I'm constantly being flooded with this Bloomberg stuff. Yep, he's been doing a really hard push. Even a lot of uh, a lot of meme accounts have been partnering with him, so he's really trying to get the youth vote. <laughs> right. A lot of money being spent on this. Uh, I just – I don't know. I, I don't – honestly personally see anyone out there who i think could really challenge um the president at least right now a lot of things could change mm -hmm. between now and when it's time uh, to vote for the president but i just so far i don't see it personally yeah i guess we'll see in november yeah we will see we will see and it's, it's definitely going to be a fun ride all the way i'm enjoying it so far uh <laughs> so we shall mm -hmm. we shall see uh but before you go now, I have one thing I want to share with everyone. I'm, I'm glad everyone did stay and listen to the end, or all of you that did. Um, I want to have your take on this before we go. Uh, it's just something a little fun to add in here. It's the uh, tree murder song stuck in my head, and I hope it gets stuck in everyone else's head. Let me get this uh, on here. This was at the Seattle uh, City Council. Listen. There's an unwelcome sight in the neighborhood. A developer is being greedy. There's a hole in the sky where a tree once stood. Get in the music. 
Everybody. Such a lack of life and sound. <laughs> All that's left is bare, muddy ground. A magnificent tree was murdered. The mighty dollar cut it down. There's a hole in the sky where the tree once was. Somebody's making money. Stand up. Stand There's up. A hole in the sky <laughs> where the tree once was. Somebody's making money. Laws protect exceptional trees, but the city grants exemptions to these. Instead, they reward the developer's greed and sanction the murderer's deeds. There's a hole in the sky where the tree once was. Somebody's making money. money. There's a hole in the sky where the tree once was. Somebody's making money. No more leaves shimmering with golden light. No more gentle shedding of rains nor tulip blossoms rustling in the wind now nothing remains but that hole in the sky where the tree once was somebody's making money there's a hole in the sky where the tree once was somebody's making money there's a hole in the sky, in the sky, instead of a spreading canopy. There's a hole in the sky, in the sky, instead of a 90-year-old tree. There's a hole in the sky, in the sky, that tree did not belong to you or me. There's no, it didn't. There's a hole in the sky, where the tree should be. Welcome to Broadway, folks. That is... The uh, Seattle City Council, some people who uh, decided they wanted to sing about their position instead of talking. That's quite a new approach. <laughs> it's... Yeah, thanks for getting that stuck in my head. <laughs> yes, I hope it is stuck in everyone's head. You will not get it out for the rest of the day. I have honestly listened to it way too much, but it has <laughs> been stuck in my head. I have to find another song. God knows I cannot have that stuck in my head for the rest of the day. I will go insane. You have any <laughs> final comments before we go? Uh, well, that's it's certainly certainly one way to get your point across. Perhaps not the most effective. <laughs> I thought trees grew from the ground up, not in the sky. I mean, if trees are growing in the sky, then they definitely need to be cut down. <laughs> it's just yeah, not. I'm not really not really sure about the uh, the accuracy of that song. But... Right, that's uh, that's interesting. Thank you, Madeline, for coming on and and talking uh, with us about uh, the election going to be an interesting ride uh if you want to go yeah. uh check out madeline's work i know washington examiner a anywhere else they can go and check out what you do yeah you can uh just google the washington examiner look up my name and read some of my stuff find me on twitter it's madeline e fry um and yeah hear me talk more about politics and thanks for having me on yep glad to have you on Hope everyone else has a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening. We surely have a fun ride coming up for the rest of the year. Uh, stay tuned. We've got a lot more fun stuff coming up. This is the Jacob Kersey Program. I'm Jacob Kersey, at Real Jacob Kersey, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you.